Hello again, everyone. We are coming to the end of uh, Work versus Work chapter. And I wanted to just read you a short paragraph, if I may. Uh, I have broached a daring proposition, which I'll develop more fully later on, which is when we have sufficient knowledge of how nonviolence works and can think of the appropriate way to mobilize it, it can be used to make obsolete the scourge of war. We've seen half or so of that answer with our discussion of Prague Spring and civilian-based defense. We're going to see more of it uh, later on. But uh, the point that I'm mostly making here is that since nonviolence is a science, it should be susceptible to prediction and control, and uh, it is. But you need to know what you can predict and what you cannot predict. And we're used to thinking, if we crank up nonviolence to this extent, we will see this much of result. And it doesn't really quite work that way. And this is kind of parallel to the whole topic of work versus work. The way it does work is when you use nonviolence, things get better. And we experience this so many ways. I was once part of a group that was convened by the Bishop of Oakland. We were responding to the bishops, American Catholic bishops, uh, challenge, God's challenge in our response about uh, the possibility of just war, which has now been revoked. And uh, so I was meeting with weapon scientists and with theologians and other professors. And there was one person who was working in the weapons lab. I'll never forget, he, he gave me trouble all the time. And uh, everything I said, he, he would contradict. It's almost like what they say about um, Jinnah. He had a problem for every solution that I came up. Uh, but one day his, his guilt showed. Uh, he said, speaking as a Catholic, he said, I guess we've been on the wrong side of this for 2,000 years and I bear a terrific responsibility. And I said, no, Bill, I'm not going to let you take all the blame. We're all in this together. This is a responsibility we all share. End of conversation. Well, I thought that was the end of it. But a couple of weeks later, there was a meeting and I really wanted to be invited to this meeting because this was a meeting with funders and I wasn't invited. So my perpetual search for funding was deeply grieved. Uh, and I asked folks later what had happened in the, the meeting. And uh, what had happened was that the team who went to meet with the funders sat down and had a quick discussion before they went in. And this fellow, uh, Bill, he said to the rest of them, what would Michael say if he were here? So it has happened so often in life and uh, in nonviolence in particular that when you do the right thing, you have positive results. And you remember, we made this point in connection with the Gaviotans way back in chapter one, that because they chose nonviolence, all kinds of good things resulted. And I think it's worth emphasizing this because we're constantly approaching uh, it, like gun control and issues like that, with this unrealistic expectation that if we take away half the guns, it'll reduce half the homicides or something like that. Uh, or can we identify the people? This is where it really uh, hurts us, I believe. Can we identify the people who are going to go over the edge and commit mayhem of some kind and stop them before we get there? And the answer is no, we can never do that. But we can predict that if we increase the violence that goes into our culture, there will be more violent episodes. So it's by way of trying to refocus us on the question that we can resolve that I make this point at the end of the chapter. So let's uh, reflect on that. And next time we meet, we will be talking about, uh, a, in a way, a much more positive a uh, set of considerations, and that is how to build the world we want through nonviolence.